Welcome, welcome, welcome. Well, we're going to talk about some really big things today. We have some wonderful folks here with us to assist in our conversation, and I'm going to be talking more about uh, that. And it's just good to see folks. My goodness, I recognize so many people and I'm so grateful that you're all here to join us for this conversation and really excited for what I have learned already just in the preparation for this cafe. And so, um, so yeah. Um, so my name is Rashenda Fairhurst. I'm an elder in the uh, Pacific Northwest Conference. I live in Oregon, Southern Oregon. And uh, I uh, work with the United Methodist Creation Justice Movement and Oregon Interfaith Power and Light and Ecumenical Ministries of Oregon. And I'm betting that you all work in different ways too. So I'm going to encourage you, please put your name in the chat. And um, if you're an earth keeper, United Methodist earth keeper, quite a lot of us on this call are share. You can share that, share how your project's going. Um, if you have any questions, um, the chat is really, it's open because I really love that during our cafes, we tend to use that and I encourage you to do so. So this is the movement cafe. Do that on the first day of school. If you're supposed to be here this is this is language class if you're if you think this is algebra you need to find a different class to be in. so uh this is the movement cafe every uh month uh, monthly on wednesday this third wednesday with all sorts of different topics and the host for this is the united methodist creation justice movement and to tell us more about the united methodist creation justice movement i'm gonna pass it over to kathy valeskis eberhardt go ahead kathy Greetings, everyone. Great to see so many people coming on, um, both folks I know and folks I don't know. I just love how this movement continues to grow and more and more people um, are joining and taking part. Um, I am an earth keeper in the Minnesota Annual Conference, a layperson, small business owner, mother and grandmother, um, and uh, really excited to a long time United Methodist was um, born into this into the church as my parents are pastors. And so when I know knew I needed to take more action on climate change, I decided to do that in the denomination of the United Methodist Church. Um, as many of us became earth keepers and started to find us at find each other at events and conferences, we realized that more needed to be done. Uh, the United Methodist Church has a long history of uh, and tradition of affirming a vocation of creation justice, and that's really what we'll be talking about today. Um, all of the kind of words and principles um, that that guide us, that inspire us, that encourage us to take action. Um, and as we were um, kind of learning about those words back, even uh, as we became earth keepers, we realized that there is also kind of a um, aspiration gap, a gap between the beautiful words that we have and the actions. And so this United Methodist Creation Justice Movement has emerged at this moment of urgency for the exact reason of trying to close that gap, to really pay attention to the words that we have and the aspirations we have as a denomination and to take action together. And so some of what that looks like is a variety of um, work teams. Um, there are uh, teams for worship, for solar, for advocacy and communications, uh, for annual conference organizing and more. And so uh, there are a lot of ways to get engaged and I encourage you to learn more about that at the umcreationjustice.org uh, website. Um, but for today, we're going to be I'm really excited about this conversation because we'll be diving in more deeply into the, the social principles and the those kind of words of our church and what they might say to us at this moment in time around the decisions we need to be making around the election. And so um, that's all I'm safe for today. We'll have lots of uh, links that we'll share later. Encourage you to reach out and get connected. If there's something that isn't um, yet being happening, we can we can take action together on it. We'll add it to that list of work teams. Uh, so I'm going to turn it back to you, Rashinda. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, and as we're rolling in, um, I am just uh, want to reiterate that uh, we invite you to introduce yourself in the chat. Let us know uh, where you are in the world, because um, we have some good mornings, some good afternoons here for sure. I don't know if we have any good evenings. We might. Um, so just really glad you're here. I also wanted to quickly introduce uh, Don Lewis, who is part of the you know, uh, the, the Movement Cafe team and an earth keeper and uh, doing uh, leading creation care in her neck of the woods in North Carolina as well. So so if you need anything during the cafe, uh, you can reach out to Don or myself or Kathy uh, with any questions. 
Um, and um, so, so now let's just get started. So I would like to introduce our very first presenter. Uh, Daryl Stevens is here with us. He teaches at the Lancaster Theological Seminary and serves as the chair of the Order of Deacons in the Eastern Pennsylvania Annual Conference of the United Methodist Church. He previously served on the staff of the General Commission on the Status and Role of Women and wrote the 2021 Spiritual Growth Mission Study for the United Women in Faith. He writes about moral leadership, social change, and the common good on his blog, Ethics Considered, and I'm going to pop that in the chat. He's also been writing about environmental uh, concerns in the church at, on the website, which we'll link to later again. Um, he's got a couple of backgrounders. What, what, is it, what does environment look like uh, in the United Methodist Church? What, what's our history? And um, I picked up this book, his newest book, and it's got a wonderful chapter integrated into a conversation around who are we as Methodists today. So uh, with that, I want to turn it over to Daryl. Well, thank you, Rashenda. Appreciate that. It's good to be with everyone today. Uh, I am going to be talking about environmental holiness. Um, and before I do so, I'm going to give you a quiz so that we'll find out what we know about environmental holiness before we start. And we'll share all the, the answers anonymously. Um, so let's go ahead and start the quiz. There's seven quick questions. Just don't don't spend too much time wrestling with it. Just uh, choose your best answers and we'll see what we come up with. Okay, let's see the results. Oh, the quiz gives you a hint as to what we'll be talking about. And don't worry if you didn't get all the questions, um, that's fine. Um, and yes, someone asked if they could use this, and I'll, I'll make this available. So um, let's start Geraldine. with number one. And okay. So environmental holiness, the phrase coined by, and what was the most uh, popular answer? Can you tell us that? Uh, the most popular was uh, Ellen Ott, Marshall for the Council of Bishops in 2009, but it was close with the top one from John Wesley. Okay, yeah, John Wesley did not actually use the phrase environmental holiness. Um, Ellen Ott Marshall and, Cap, uh, and Pat Callback Harper um, were talking with Ted Runyon um, around the kitchen table and came up with this phrase to um, talk about uh, our, our call to care for the environment because um, Ellen was writing God's renewed creation call for hope and action for the Council of Bishops. And that was in 2009. So number two, John Wesley's claim, there is no religion but social religion, no holiness but social holiness. And that refers to? This is uh, social justice, such as abolition of the slave trade was the most, uh, uh, the, the highest answer at 50%, and uh, answers two and three split the rest. All right, the, the correct answer here is actually this um, letter B, Small group accountability and religious societies. When John oh, Wesley was talking about social holiness, he was talking about the idea that you can't be a Christian by yourself. That to be a Christian requires support and accountability, and that happened in classes and bands and the religious societies. Um, to to call it social justice would be anachronistic. Uh, that was not a word or phrase that was used in Wesley's time. So um, when Wesley was talking about no religion but social religion, he's talking about us gathering together as Christians to say, how goes it with your soul? And to check in on each other and to support each other as we grow in the life of faith. Okay, and so the general rules are part of that. If you know the general rules. Number three, holiness is... 
What was and the most popular answer? 73% on A, the transforming work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. 23% chose another okay. word for Christian section. So that is correct. That um, I, I'm using Randy Maddox's definition of the Holy Spirit, which is of, of, of holiness as being the transforming work of grace in our lives. Um, David Field also defines holiness as the gracious work of God in human persons, which transforms us so that our lives are characterized by love of God, love for God, and our fellow human beings. So, yes, we've got a good handle on that one. Um, number four. So Wesley taught that there are two ways to experience holiness, by yourself or with others through shared activities, true or false? 77% uh, said true. So actually, Wesley would say this is false. And the reason is there are not two ways to experience holiness. There's one way to experience holiness that we, um, that is when he says there's no religion but social religion, he's not saying there's, or no holiness, but social holiness. Um, he's not saying there's personal holiness and there's social holiness and we have two different ways. He's saying there's one holiness that we experience individually and communally. So it's a, a single focus in his soteriology. Um, holiness understood as experience of, of grace, of, cooperant uh, exercise of the Holy Spirit in our lives, we experience both both individually and in groups, but it's one holiness, one Holy Spirit, one God, one grace. Great so question. social holiness is really the context for how we experience this. Rashonda? Perfect. Um, so yes, uh, number five. So number five, <clears throat> um, and I think I already, I may have already answered this one. So, it, um, true or false, it is anachronistic to project environmental holiness back onto Wesley's theology. Um, he was only concerned with salvation of human souls because humanity is who Christ came to save and no other part of creation can confess Jesus Christ as Savior. What did we say? A false, overwhelmingly, 85%. Yeah. Actually, Wesley was concerned about the souls of animals and whether animals would be part of the new creation and God's um, future kingdom. So, and, and actually, if we read in John 3.16, um, for God so loved the world, and that the world there, that's the, the Greek word is cosmos. That's all of creation. So for God so loved all of creation, that he gave his only son. And we can look at Colossians um, chapter 1, verses 15 through 20. Christ came to redeem all creation. So we see that in multiple places in scripture as well. All right, number six may have gotten you riled up because when the quiz came up on screen, it said, choose only one. But some of you may have wanted to choose more than one. And the uh, let's, Rashenda, what did we get for answers here? Well, let's put it this way. Nobody chose we are saved by good works. Nobody chose number three. Uh, most people chose number one. Um, and then in second place was number four. And with 8% squeaking in a showing was number two. All right. That, actually, these are all true. So uh, all of them are true. Salvation is a present thing. If you read John Wesley's um, sermon, Scripture Way of Salvation, you'll see that very clearly. Um, we are saved by grace through faith. That's uh, Ephesians chapter 2. And um, we are saved, letter C, we are saved for good works, not by good works. Oh, but we are saved you know what? For good works. And that's why it's true. 
and which no. are necessary for sanctification. That, that is given time and opportunity. All right. um, I I deserve a, a big F on my exam there. I <laughs> inputted this and I took that as a typo and I put in by instead of for. Um, oh, and, um, oh, you changed the quiz. I changed that one. So I threw a wrench in the works. So that was my bad. So four good works. Uh, I, I definitely okay. need to take one of your classes, Daryl, to, to brush up on my Wesley here. And the last one, number seven, Methodist environmental witness interprets the domain. They're called to dominion in Genesis 128 to mean, and what did we say here? Oh, 96% went with uh, question four, answer four, and 4% 4 to number three, and zero on the rest. Okay. Humans must exercise responsible stewardship over the natural world. That is right. Now, in our um, Methodist tradition, um, say 80 years ago, we talked about dominion in terms of um, control of resources, as we have to conserve resources. But that's not the way we talk about creation care anymore, um, because we, we've learned that um, and the new social principles talk about us being part of the community of creation, not being separate from creation, not creation as a resource for us to use, but creation actually, and I'll just read one part of this before I stop and hand it over. Creation, it says we are, I'm reading from the New Social Principles. We are called to honor the role of every part of creation in healing the whole. We humans are part of complex ecosystems, all valued by God. We are in interconnected members of complex ecosystems. So not only are we part of creation and we are to exercise care within creation, but we depend on every part of creation to heal the whole. That is, we're all wrapped up together with creation in finding our collective salvation. So that's a little bit about environmental holiness. I'm going to hand it over to the next speaker, and we can come back um, to this as we have questions and discussion. All right, that sounds great. So um, I would like to then shift also to do another introduction. And I'd like to introduce a Reverend Keith Sexton. Uh, he is a semi-retired elder living as coordinator of, uh, serving as coordinator of advocacy for the creation care team of the North Carolina Annual Conference. He is a co-creator of the Regenerative Agriculture Toolbox a resource to aid congregations in connecting and supporting local farmers, as well as employing regenerative land practices for church-owned land. Keith is a member of the board of the North of the Carolina Farm Stewardship Association, and for the past four years has served on the organizing committee for the North Carolina Food Advocacy uh, System Coalition, advocating for farm, food, and climate justice on the 2023 Farm Bill. And I'm going to uh, pop his uh, intro into the chat and go ahead, Keith. Well, it is a joy to be with you today and to share this with you. And um, if uh, Rashinda will put the, um, the uh, slides up, um, we're going to begin uh, with this reality that we are citizens of two different realms. First and overarching, by our baptism, we're called to a particular and peculiar life in the kingdom of God. And second, that life shapes us in our citizenship in the nation, the state, and our community. Politics is often confused with partisanship. They are not the same, and they are not synonyms. We all are aware of the fact that politics rises from the Greek word for village, uh, city, or community. Uh, thus, politics in its best form are conversations for the greatest good for the whole community. And in that way, the gospel is deeply political. Hear what Jesus said, to bring good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, to heal the sick, 
to set free those who are oppressed and to announce God's redemptive work. And Jesus summed up all of the law and the prophets to love God with all our being and pour that love out towards our neighbors as we would ourselves. So our work today is to be in the political realm and the public square grounded in the life and teachings of Jesus. And we have seen in the conversation that we've just had that our social principles and our Wesleyan tradition deeply roots us in scripture. So did you know the word partisan actually appears in the New Testament? It's often translated as division, sect, or party. It's pronounced in Greek, heresy. It's translated into English, heresy. The breaking apart of our oneness. So we have this unusual task today of, in this current climate, trying to bring people together. When you hear people in our congregation saying, keep politics out of the pulpit and out of the church. If you drill down on that statement, People are saying, let's not bring divisive partisan politics into the congregation or saying, don't make me think about my politics. Thus, our task here is to be truthful, live into our baptismal calling faithfully, and bring people together. So yes, it seems like a mission nearly impossible. And yet our ancestors did so while being declared enemies of the state of Rome and the church grew rapidly. So I want to point you to an article that uh, Rashenda will put in the chat from the Center for Church Leadership at Wesley Theological Seminary. It gives us how to be um, in this kingdom of God while inhabiting a political world. And they give us four points. To be salty, to be clear and consistent with the truth and the demands that places on our Christian faith. And of course, as we know, the right amount of salt makes a meal much more inviting. And that's our job, to be inviting and not divisive. Prophetic, seeing the truth clearly and speaking the truth from a place of love and what I call withness, being with the community rather than coming at them from down the mountain kind of approach. And separationists, living out our faith and at the same time safeguarding the liberty of others to practice their faith or no faith at all. And pluralists, knowing that because of God's sovereignty, we don't have to grab after political control, but rather seek the common good for the entire community. And so what we want to do now is to look at Republican, Democrat, and Project 2025 side by side on a few issues and see some of their quotes. So if we will, let's go to the next slide. You see the climate on climate, and you see the three the three different platforms, Republican, Project 2025, and Democrat. There is urgency and reality of climate change, and you see the responses. A willingness to continue in the Paris Accords, and you see the responses of the three platforms. And funding for the EPA as an enforcement agency versus compliance. This is an important point. Compliance means that the agency, the individual, or the industry would self-regulate, check in on themselves. And here in North Carolina, we've seen, and I'm sure in your areas you've seen, where self-regulation doesn't work. And for us, it's the PFAS issue going on in eastern North Carolina. So... Is the funding there for enforcement that means inspection, correction, and fines if necessary? So that's the point of that slide. The next slide, please. Dawn, if you'll read that slide. Yes, sorry, I was, I was muted. Uh, Democrat, quotes on climate. Democrat platform includes nine pages on climate, pages 31 through 39. The climate crisis is decades in the making an existential threat to future generations who deserve better. Democrats reject the false cho choice between growing our economy and combating climate change, 
We can and must do both at the same time. We agree with scientists and public health experts that the United States and the world must achieve net zero greenhouse gas emissions as soon as possible and no later than 2050. That's from the Democratic Party platform. And you see the link there. You can find the platform. Um, it is a 92 page document. And that particular section is an easy read for anyone who'd like to take it on. Next slide. Okay, I'll jump in and read this one. Um, uh, the link you'll see there uh, to get learn more about the Republican platform. Uh, the first quote is to number one, unleash American energy. Under President Trump, the U.S. became the number one producer of oil and natural gas in the world, and we will soon be again by lifting restrictions on American energy production and terminating the socialist Green New Deal. Republicans will unleash energy production from all sources, including nuclear, to immediately slash inflation and power American homes, cars, and factories with reliable, abundant, and affordable energy from Chapter 1.1. On the other quote, number four, reliable and abundant low cost energy. Republicans will increase energy production across the board, streamline permitting and end market distorting restrictions on oil, natural gas and coal. The Republican party will once again make America energy independent and then energy dominant, lowering energy prices even below the record lows achieved during President Trump's first term, chapter 4.4. Next slide, please. Project 2025 quotes on climate. The mandate has 887 pages of text and footnotes. I've read them all and there is no section on climate. This is what they say on page 11. It is cheap grace. Aptly describes the left's love affair with environmental extremism. At the very heart, environmental extremism is dedicated, it is decidedly anti-human. And they go on to to say in other places the this same thing. Um, environmentalology uh, bans the fuels that run almost all the world's cars, planes, factories, farms, and electrical grids. Um, at the bottom of this slide, um, agriculture, climate, conservation measures are determined speculative uh, on page 308, 304, excuse me. And when climate engine issues are mentioned throughout the document. Uh, they're labeled expensive, extremist, and on pages 292 and 293, you see so-called in quotes um, regarding climate start legislation. And in the name of combating climate change, policies have been used to create an artificial energy scarcity that will require trillions of dollars in new investment supported with taxpayer subsidies to address a problem that government and special interests themselves have created. The next slide, please. So you see here some policy issues. Pausing or ending fracking, none of the platforms do that. For clean energy and a renewable energy grid, you see the responses there. For supporting EV production, including subsidies, you see the responses Neither the Republican nor Project 2025 platforms offer any substantive words on regenerative agriculture. So I, I leave that as a question mark. And on the moratorium on uh, liquid nat natural gas exports, given that the vice president, uh, Kamala Harris, has changed her position on fracking, we leave that as a question mark too, because we do not know um, if that will change also. Next slide. So here are some policy quotes from Project 2025. Um, on page 290, environmental issues should always take a backseat to agriculture production itself. Uh, on page 294, Congress never envisioned or intentioned the billions of dollars that are being used for climate change policies. And the important piece on uh, page 364 and 365, is repealing the IRA and the JOBS Act, both of which have funded a great deal of climate change mitigation in the ag industry and in other places. Um, 
So the next slide. Don, if you'll chime in here. Um, Democrat policy quotes, we will set a bold national goal of achieving net zero greenhouse gas emissions for all new buildings by 2030 on the pathway to creating a 100% clean building sector. Within five years, we will install 500 million solar panels, including 8 million solar roofs and community solar energy systems and 60,000 wind turbines and turn American ingenuity into American jobs by leveraging federal policy to manufacture renewable energy solutions in America. Democrats recognize that climate change poses serious risks to the economy and the financial system. We will require public companies to disclose climate risks and greenhouse gas emissions in their operations and supply chains. We will hold polluters and corporate executives accountable for intentionally hiding or distorting material information and for affecting the health and safety of workers and communities. And there's the, the, the source at the bottom, the quote. All right, the next slide, please. And uh, from the Republican uh, platform, some policy quotes. American workers are the most productive, talented, and innovative on earth. The only thing holding them back is the suffocating policies of the Democrat Party. Our America First economic agenda rests on five pillars, slashing regulations, cutting taxes, securing fair trade deals, ensuring reliable and abundant low-cost energy, and champion innovation. Together, we will restore economic prosperity and opportunity for all Americans. Um, from the preamble, there's also um, the idea of canceling the electric vehicle mandate and cut costly and burdensome regulations. And then uh, another mention that President Trump will remove all red tape that is leaving oil and natural gas projects stranded, including speeding up approval of natural gas pipelines into the Marcellus Shale of Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and New York. The next slide, please. So what's next? And I, I'm here to tell you we're at the beginning, not the end. Um, as John Wesley taught us, we pray, we search the scriptures, and we fast. And we enter into holy conversations, if we can. Um, those kinds of conversations, not only with those who are like-minded, but especially with those who are not, because if we can share the same heart, we can work together. And of course, check now on your registration, because um, registration rosters have been purged in the last year, and then vote. And I would invite you to do this create piece. And you can find this in the um, in the toolbox as well. And you notice it's based on asset-based community development. Connect widely and discover creation folks in your community. Relationship building for a strong and diverse grassroots network. We're a connectional church, and we have got to get to the point that our connections are beyond the United Methodist Church. We become ecumenical in our faith and our connections and empower the church to do so, so that we act together to do creation care visibly in the community. And then curate and tell your stories in all kinds of venues, uh, any civic club meeting, um, community festivals, to build awareness and allies. And having done this, then we can engage elected representatives with story and data from our work on the front lines. Advocacy is asking for action on bills for creation care. And um, in a moment, you'll see the power of story, but here's the story in a thousand words. Over eight, 480 acres of farm and woodland have been turned into this scar called the Mariah Energy Center. And um, you'll hear the story of what advocacy has been doing with this issue. So I hope that we've presented the three different platforms in a nonpartisan way, and you've gotten a feel for what's there. And of course, this is just the tip of the iceberg with uh, with each of those platforms. So I'll turn it back over to Roshenda now. Um, and this is, uh, we, we talked about the uh, Republican, Democratic, and um, this is what, these are quotes from our United Methodist 
energy policy. Now, uh, we have a whole set, of course, of um, social principles, which include the natural world. So uh, what I did, though, is look specifically at our, um, our energy policies. Uh, the, the United Methodist Church does have an energy policy and what it says. So this is what it says. We support stren strenuous efforts to conserve energy, efficiency, and transition to renewable energy, combat global warming, protect human health, create new jobs, and secure an af af and ensure a secure, affordable energy future. We support strenuous efforts to provide transition pathways for communities currently dependent on old energy economies, such as fossil fuel and nuclear power and large scale, scale hydro projects. We seek a healthier and more equitable energy future. We will model sustainable and just energy values. We will model rapid transition to clean renewable energy. We urge all annual conferences, churches, and agencies to develop ambitious, just, and equitable transition pathways for their energy sources to be clean and renewable. We support increased government funding for research and development of renewable energy sources and elimination of fossil fuel subsidies. We encourage the development and deployment of renewable energy technologies and government incentives. We believe it is a matter of justice. We exhort the United Methodist Church at all levels to engage in a serious study of these energy issues in the context of the Christian faith, educating our congregants, taking action to lessen our impact on the environment, and advocating for policies that respond to the growing threat of climate change. And this is, um, like I say, uh, this was voted on uh, it, at the 20, at, as revised. So it existed beforehand, it was revised and voted on at the General Conference 2024. Um, and it was developed through the processes at the uh, Board of Church, General Board of Church and Society. Back to you. Um, I don't know if, uh, Daryl, you'd like to respond to any of that in the next couple of minutes, just kind of what you've seen and uh, go ahead. Thank you, Rishanda. I, I would like to add something um, and I'll put that in the chat. There are some recurring themes in the United Methodist Environmental Witness. And I have I've speak about recurring themes as in since the 1930s. So for decades, we've been fairly consistent in the kinds of concerns we've had, and we've been on the front lines of evolving concerns. We first spoke about global warming in 1980 with our energy policy statement. So 44 years ago, the United Methodist Church was calling attention to the problem of greenhouse gases and the warming atmosphere. So in our environmental holiness witness, uh, these are some common themes, human responsibility. That is, we have stewardship. When we talk about creation care, that's what we're talking about. Justice, we're now ta talking about creation justice. Justice means just relationships. That is um, abundant life for all, providing for basic human needs as well as full human flourishing and full flourishing for all of creation. Sustainability is a big um, part of this, is what we're doing sustainable for the next generation and the generations after that. Participation, participation of all persons. So in the United Methodist, the new so revised social principles, you'll see a concern for participation of particularly indigenous persons, and valuing their wisdom and traditional wisdom. You'll see an uh, emphasis on participation by communities that are most impacted by climate change. And so for example, the idea of environmental racism um, and we need to empower folks who are living in impacted communities to have a voice and to be able to participate and make decisions about their own communities. 
of and quality of common life. This is often called the common good. And that's not only a United Methodist theme, uh, if you're familiar with Roman Catholic social teachings, the common good is one of their um, handful of principles that their teachings are based on. And so someone mentioned intersectionality. Um, a, another common theme, which I didn't put in this list, is that United Methodist Environmental Witness and um, has recognized the intricacy and interdependency of so many problems. So when we talk about um, climate change, we're also talking about racism. We're also talking about um, the um, sovereignty for, lo for local communities and nations. Here. Um, so we, we see that all these problems are intertwined. So creation justice doesn't sit apart from all other aspects of our social principles. It's, it's, it's mixed in. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you, Daryl. Um, so we're gonna segue to some storytelling. Okay, so those are policies, those are beautiful words as Kathy would say. Um, and what, what does it mean on the ground when we're in the midst of things? What are we looking at? What are the challenges we're facing in our communities? And so I wanna turn uh, next to uh, Reverend Dr. T uh, Tracy Sexton, who is here to share a story that we got a little bit of a preview of uh, just a minute ago. Uh, so uh, go ahead, Tracy. Okay. And you probably can't see, but I have my no mech shirt on today. Um, so um, where to start? <laughs> it's a long story and I'm trying to make it short, but um, I grew up on my family's farm. Before I was born, my grandfather raised tobacco. And during my lifetime, we've had beef cattle on the farm. My father worked a full-time job, but he, he raised vegetables for us. So we grew up having corn and tomato and potatoes and other vegetables from this farm. And this farm is about five miles from Dominion Energy's 485 acre Mariah Energy Center. On the heels of the momentous COP28 and the call for governments to speed up the transition away from fossil fuels to renewables, Dominion Energy seeks to build a 25 million gallon methane gas storage facility for peak demands. And they have plans to add another 25 million gallon tank to the site. I, I don't have words that fully express my grief for the land that has already been scarred as they cleared trees and created significant runoff into streams that are home to endangered species and that provide water to Lake Mickey, which is Durham's drinking water supply. Neighbors have been collecting water samples downstream from the Mech. The turbidity is 25 times above what is allowed by the state of North Carolina. Dominion should have gotten a permit to have that kind of impact on the water quality, but in their planning for the site, they said that they would have no impact on water. Obviously, they did not do an accounting accurately, and the damage and destruction of our waterways testifies against them. The last hurdles for Dominion include an air quality permit from the state and lawsuits citizens have brought against the Person County Board of Commissioners for going against their own statutes and rezoning this agricultural land to industrial. The lawsuit notice says Person County residents and environmental justice organizations have filed a complaint to stop the construction of the dangerous Mariah Energy Center. Members of Person County Community Action Network with support from Southern Coalition for Justice, Social Justice filed the complaint on February the 2nd, alleging the Person County Board of Commissioners ignored the sincere concerns and compelling public testimony from residents about pollutants, public health, environmental harm, and overall community impact that would result from the rezoning of residential and rural conservation areas to accommodate Dominion Energy. On December the 4th, the Board of Commissioners for Person County had held a hearing about rezoning the land for Dominion Energy. 36 people spoke against the zoning change and around 300 gathered in the auditorium with standing room only. After the concerned citizens spoke against the zone, zoning change, raising questions about the project, though we were not allowed to actually ask the questions, um, 
the, the commissioners who could ask questions refused to do so and in 20 seconds went against the wishes of those gathered and approved the zoning change. People chanted, shame, shame. And we had been told prior to the hearing that it was a done deal and the hearing was a formality. Well, the 20 seconds it took for them to approve the rezoning were an exclamation point to the, it's a done deal. Uh, Dominion Energy is a company that is in financial difficulty and it's using the Mariah Energy Center as part of its plan to save itself by sacrificing those in its vicinity. And that's actually what they call it, a sacrifice zone. Dominion doesn't intend to keep Mariah Energy Center. They are simply doing the dirty work for Enbridge, a Canadian company with a horrendous environmental track record who intends to purchase the MEC. The state's Air Quality Department held a hearing on August the 1st, two counties over from Person County in Vance County because the state could not reach an agreement with any venues within the county that could accommodate a large gathering. Really? Still, 38 people traveled to speak and oppose an air permit for Dominion Energy. Only one person spoke in favor of the air permit, and he is with the Carolina Natural Gas Coalition. The bottom line for the air quality permit hearing is that citizens do not believe Dominion's modeling is correct. In other words, Dominion says their pollution will be under the thresholds that would make them have to follow Title V regulations. We pointed to their underestimation of the effects they would have on water quality as indication that they have also underestimated their air quality metrics. Points that came up at that August 1st um, hearing as citizens testified, one speaker wanted them to resolve the question about the equipment Dominion is planning to use before any permitting decision is made. Because how could Dominion possibly model appropriately when they haven't even committed to what equipment they will be using? Another person asked, them to clarify with whom does the buck stop? Who is in charge of regulating Dominion and MEC? Is it the Department of Air Quality, the Department of Transportation, or there was some other acronym that was thrown around? The Environmental Integrity Project was able to assist us uh, at MEC, the no MEC people, by providing an expert's opinion on Dominion's air quality model modeling. And he pointed out how they failed to cons the things that they considered to that they did not consider in their modeling. Previously, Caroline Hansley from the Sierra Club had explained that our NOMAC fight is really part of a three-phase plan to expand new fracked gas across the Carolinas. Dominion Energy along with Duke Energy have massive plans that include the Mariah Energy Center and, it, and a revised methane gas pipeline from Chatham, Virginia into Rockingham County, North Carolina, and the, uh, and the conversion of the Duke Energy Person County plant from coal to gas. Alamance County is just a couple of counties over and fought to keep the Mountain Valley pipeline away from their county. And now it looks like the pipeline could move toward Person County with Dominion's T-15 reliability project. The aerial photo of the MEC that, that Keith showed you is from an article by Inside Climate News. In that article, um, it's about a 35 minute listen. They tell the story through Andrea Childers a 30-year Person County resident who is next door to Mech and contemplating whether she'll move. I'll put the link in the chat and recommend that you give it a listen. And so now we wait. Will the Department of Air Quality deny the permit, grant the permit as is? Will they require Dominion to follow Title V? What will happen with the lawsuits against the county commissioners? What can you do? Pray for the people in the area of this site. And if you want to know more, you can go to nomec.org. The one bright spot that several of us have named in all of this is that we have met neighbors that we didn't know before. All right, thank you so much. Um, so um, I'm gonna take a minute as well to offer some uh, perspective um, and some, some good news, right? Some, we know these battles, we feel these battles, um, and uh, they're not, it's, it's, you know, we can in fact uh, do uh, really important things and it can be successful. So um, this is just a short uh, stakes and successes, um, the story of the thin green line in the Pacific Northwest that was coined by Eric Laplace at Sightline. Um, and uh, from the Book of Discipline, Water, air, soil, minerals, energy resources, plants, and animal life 
are to be valued and conserved because they are God's creation and not solely because they are useful to human beings. And in terms of like, what does it mean to be Methodist? And what are the stakes here? Obviously there's a, my grandson uh, is at stake here. <laughs> so I care about that. Um, this is a picture from um, Talent, Oregon. Actually, there was the Almeda fire. We see a lot of pictures nowadays of fire and fire damage and smoke. I was in the evacuation zone um, watching the single lane cars with horse trailers and people trying to get get out. Uh, the way the wind was blowing, people who weren't facing the smoke didn't know the fire was coming. It moved so fast. Um, and this, what you're seeing, this little house, it's all gone. Um, and, uh, you know, I I'm not going to bombard you with fire photos because we've seen so many, but uh, this was this was in my home. And this was the outcome um, of of the fire we had of the children and families in the local school district. Um, forty percent were made homeless or evacuated. Uh, twenty six hundred homes burned. Forty two thousand people displaced. And two years later, there were still uh, almost a hundred children that lacked permanent. And the school districts had to really accommodate. They were amazing really accommodating. They were busing children in from wherever they their temporary housing was so they could stay with their peers and learn. Uh, we, we almost lost the brand new high school that got built to the fire in the elementary school. Uh, the firefighters were, we love our firefighters here. Let's put it that way. Um, so this is uh, the community that got really hard hit um, as the just the, the green area that the fire just poured through. Uh, had many, many Hispanic, uh, Spanish-speaking people, um, uh, immigrants from uh, uh, South America, Latin America, and um, there wasn't really, you know, there, the the response was, despite the fact that it happened in 2020, we're still learning how to respond to these, um, and this restaurant, El Tapatio, literally just opened every door it had and fed people and created um, this whole like tent um, donation center where many of us were just dropping things off like diapers and diapers and more diapers and the things that you know people need in emergency. Many people lost everything. I mean, there's they they were at work. The fire moved so fast, and um, it, it was people lost that lost their life savings too because of the way banking can work for immigrant communities. Um, everything burned. Everything burned. Um, people couldn't get back to get their pets. Um, so this part, it's just really hard, right? The, the, this is something I didn't expect that all through these neighborhoods that burned down, people left out dog food and cat food and water and little video trying to see if their pet had made it through. And the vet clinics all around here had injured animals and they'd post the photos. Is this, this is your baby? Is this your fur baby? And the, the, we have to understand things get harmed and wounded in fires. It's there's there's not a zero, there's, it's not a victimless issue. And what about this little guy? Where does he go in the fire? You know, the thirsty animals that were on the move. Um, what do we do with that? So as people of faith, what can we do? And the answer to that for me was that we have to get in the game. That we're not, unfortunately, our bishops are not taking action but we do have to get in the game. And um, so, um, oops, this is our why we have to get in the game. So in our, so the first fossil fuel effort that I was involved in had to do with oil trains. It was the Tesero Savage oil by rail ship terminal that was proposed for the Columbia River, 360,000 barrels of crude oil every day, 15 million gallons daily would be delivered by rail so they, they, instead of building a pipeline, they just figured they'd rail, put it in by rail. Um, so this was by neighborhoods, air quality. There was a 60, so the, and what happened is what we built here was a coalition of nurses, union folks, teamsters, indigenous folks, you name it. We built this, I say we, cause I got to be this tiny, tiny, tiny part of it. But this huge uh, group of people who said no, a uh, 60 day comment period, oops, um, uh, was for the draft environmental impact had 290,000 comments. Thousands of people marched, 
rallied and over a million statements to protect the Pacific Northwest from oil and coal exports were delivered to Governor Jay Inslee, the Washington governor at the time in 2017. So we're ports, Oregon, Washington, we have ports, Northern California that go to Asia to sell and make money uh, from the Bakken crude coming out of South Dakota, uh, coal coming out of Wyoming. They wanna get it to market. And we're like, not through us, you're not. Um, this is a picture of that um, hearing. I'm standing there in the red um, with a Don Orange. And we had port commissioners who said yes to this project, who were so clueless talking about their ski vacations and how their kids didn't seem to be worried. So why were we worried? Um, and so we literally had to replace those folks. So Don Orange ran for port commissioner, Eric LeBrant ran for port commissioner. There are three port commissioners and that's what it took to say no to this project. Um, here's me uh, goofing off as usual when I do testimony. To, I usually have some sort of, you know, be memorable in some way. I had apples talking about Washington apples and how delicious they were and how important it was that we had clean environment for, for that. And you can see just the mass of people at the rally. Also, you got to get to your state senators and your, and your national senators. Um, here's me with Ann Rivers. She's a Republican a state senator talking to her about the environmental issues to Sorrel and other things. And uh, here's me also with Brian, who is Senator Maria Cantwell's staff member. Again, you just, we gotta do this. We gotta just get there. Um, so the, 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 the degree of numbers that, I don't know who turned the faucet on, but somebody decided they wanted to go through the Pacific Northwest. And the, there were so many projects and the, the combined carbon would have been like five XL pipelines. And um, I'm not sure who, who said this, it's morally rec reckless. Um, it wasn't a bishop, I wish it had been, um, but um, it was somebody in the secular world who understood the morality as a problem here. Then there's plastics. So the methanol, uh, the calam again, they're trying to get them out out to the to across the the ocean through us, and we said no. And this is first they tried to put this giant plastics methanol factory in Tacoma. They didn't manage that. Then they tried to do it in Kalama, which was a small town with less ability to fight back. And ninety percent of methanol, of course, is produced from methane and fracked gas, and they would have produced thirty to 320 million cubic feet of this gas daily, um, 5 million gallons of water every day from the Columbia and Kalama River aquifers. Um, I mean, this is like, it's mind boggling that this can even be proposed from my perspective. So I definitely have a perspective on this. Um, and uh, so, you know, you have your perspective too. I'm not saying you should have my perspective, but but this is mine. Um, as for coal, same thing. They're, they're putting the trains full of coiled coal, 92 millions of coal annually. That's what they wanted to have travel through our region by train and out on ships uh, through our ports. And um, yeah, boy. Uh, and then here's, here's all of this quote, against the odds and even their own expectations, activists blocked nearly every effort to use the region's ports to expand the global fossil fuel trade between 2024 and 2017. And by the spring of 2018, all of the new oil and coal terminals in the Northwest had been defeated. This is this is staggering. This is it's, so it's possible, but the coalition was enormous and that's what it takes. Um, so that's where this thin green line got coined uh, to the Tesoro Savage crude oil transfer that I talked about in the beginning that was denied in 2018. And since then, the victories keep coming. The Jordan Cove frack death pipeline was canceled in 2021. Millennium Coal was finally done by 2021. The last coal plant in Oregon was demolished early in 2022. Um, the methanol uh, plastics factory was defeated in 2021. We're still dealing with the GTN Express pipeline, so they can't build one, right? So what they're going to try to do is pump the one that we have so full of gas, even though it's old, it needs replacing. So we'll see if they, we'll see if they get that. Um, and and here's here's my, this is our this is our conversation today, um, and uh, yeah. 
that that's my that's my part of this and um well, let me I'm back to to multiple windows as I as I navigate that and I have of course a head of steam right now um <laughs> because I've just gone through that so I believe we are now turning to uh Mel and uh, Mel Caraway is going to just talk for just a quick couple minutes because we're headed into breakout rooms um, you know, how do we talk about this stuff, right? So Saving Us, uh, of course, by Catherine Hayhoe has some wonderful pieces to help us talk about it. And Mel, give us just a quick uh, little moment about that. And then Mel will be a choice for a breakout break room to, to talk more about how to tell our stories. Uh, go ahead, Mel. Thank you very much, Rashinda. It's good to see everyone today. Um, I think um, what Rashinda laid out for us just now is so important because it emphasizes the importance of communication in dealing with these environmental uh, regular uh, uh, attempts to impose uh, detrimental environmental uh, projects on us. Um, Catherine Hayhoe, in her book, if you have not read it, it's Saving Us and it's a, a climate scientist cause for hope and healing in a divided world. And Catherine Hayhoe is um, an evangelical Christian. She is the uh, chief scientist for the uh, Environmental Defense Fund, professor at Texas Tech University. And uh, she really focuses on uh, communications um, and why they are so important. She talks about understanding the facts and how the facts are important, but it's not just the facts. You have to have more than that. And uh, people are using um, uh, fear tactics to attack the facts, and we have to be able to respond to that. What she suggests is that we don't want to get into an argument. We have to be willing, even with those people who we disagree with, to listen to their point of view, but do so respectfully and confront them with facts. Um, the um, uh, As Brishinda also had uh, on her slide, vote. Voting is very, very important, and we need to encourage people to vote. I will tell you that one of the people that she quotes several times in Saving Us is a British climate communicator by the name of George Marshall. I had the opportunity of interviewing George in uh, 2019 at the uh, COP in uh, Madrid. And um, he spoke specifically about uh, communicating with uh, skeptics in the US. George has made uh, multiple trips to the US to talk to people and to on the ground in areas that are impacted by um, um, fracking uh, in Canada, in Alberta, where they have the tar sands, in Texas, where we have a great deal of uh, uh, fracking and methane problems. Uh, George has written a book also that is very good, uh, and it's um, it's titled Don't Even Think About It, Why Our Brains Are Wired to Ignore Climate Change. And um, I will put the link, um, I will put that book in the chat, and I will also put a link to the interview that I did with George. But one of the things that both George and um uh, Catherine speak to is that when we talk to people about environmental injustice, we need to respect them. We can't approach from an adversarial point of view. Um, we have to give them thanks for their past contributions. Uh, one of the things that we're dealing with right now in Texas, where I am, is we had um, massive uh, emphasis on our grid, uh, the electrical grid, and um, we are generating 
um, we, we are producing more fossil fuel than anywhere in the country, but we're also presenting more renewables in the form of wind and solar than anywhere in the country. And being able to do that is important. The faith community That's... plays a part and earth is a gift. We are a gift and we must work together. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you so much, Mel. Um, and uh, Mel is going to be uh, leading a breakout room. Um, I know that it, all of this feels so short. And so I encourage you to, um, what I'm going to do next is we are going to move to breakout room spaces. I'm going to open the rooms and you get to choose what room you want to join. Welcome back. Welcome back. I know it's never enough time. My apologies, Keith. I see your hand. Did you want to say something? Oh, you're muted if you want to say something. Oh, I was just thanking Kevin, who was in mid-sentence when we came back with some good thoughts. I was trying to encourage him. This is this is the work. So these movement cafes can feel a little like, oh, and your brain after a while is like, I can't take any more input. So you can review the video. And we have last things now, which include lots of links in the chat and such like that. I'm going to turn it over to Kathy to kind of lead us through this uh, last piece, and then we'll do our closing prayer. And uh, right, there's never enough time, but there's always a lot of follow up. If you want to save the chat, there's a three dots that you can go to save the chat. We will include these links in our follow up communication with you. But here's a few things to get you started. Um, uh, our, uh, the book that Daryl Stevens has written with more details there, some links from uh, both Tracy and Keith uh, regarding what they've worked on, the regenerative agriculture toolbox, the that article that Keith, uh, Keith was referring to, and the article that Tracy referred to about what the work happening there. Um, there are uh, several great voting specific activities happening in our denomination from church and society, from uh, discipleship. And, and then the last thing I'll share is just that the, the recording of this event will be available on our Movement Cafe page as soon as it's available. And um, we had as long as, as well as a recording of a bonus event that happened on September 12th that was also about voting. So lots of great resources um, for us to dig into and they'll be shared in the October newsletter. Okay, so uh, our our ending, uh, just amazing to be here, to have this conversation. You can review everything. So this, considering this the first bite uh, of this good work and this good effort, thank you so much to Keith and Daryl and Tracy and Mel and everybody who is here. Thank you to Benjamin who came all the way from um, from across uh, continents to be with us today. Zimbabwe. So Zimbabwe, so very, very thank you to you. And I'm thank now you. going to share <laughs> uh, share our screen for our closing prayer. Thank you to Reverend Lori Bayon who put that together for us. 
a song that I would sing at the rallies, um, encouraging the Christian witness and presence. So many people there were Christians. Uh, so little organizing was done within the Christian community, and we can make that difference. So much blessing to all of you. So grateful to see you all. Have an absolutely marvelous and blessed rest of your day.